Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Riggs, CEO of the Scleroderma Foundation, and I'm so delighted to be a part of today's event on this webinar with our partners, the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition and the Black Women's Health Imperative. Today is World Scleroderma Day, a day that we set aside with, along with our global partners from around the world, our patient advocacy organizations from Europe, Australia, Canada, here in the US and throughout South America and Asia to engage in activities that bring greater awareness to this disease. Uh, we're delighted to be a part of a broad social media campaign this month uh, throughout June that culminates on to, uh, today and to be a part of this incredible panel of speakers and this opportunity to talk about the real issues around uh, systemic sclerosis, the um, more severe type of scleroderma, uh, and how it affects people of color in particular. We have a marvelous lineup of uh, medical experts, as well as um, patient advocates who can talk about their experiences living with scleroderma. And we're just excited to be a part of all of this. Today is also a special day because the Scleroderma Foundation has announced today that we are more than doubling our commitment next year to funding research to find better treatments, hopefully the cause, and eventually the cure for scleroderma. We know that scleroderma has um, no one pathway toward how it affects people. It's a very unique and individualized disease, which makes it hard to treat and makes it hard to sometimes diagnose. And we want to talk about that a little bit today with our patient advocates who, who are here with us. But we have a great number of things to get through. So I want to, again, thank uh, our partners, the Rare Disease uh, Diversity Coalition and Black Women's Health Initiative for spearheading this opportunity to come and speak with all of you today. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Adriana Hopkins. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Riggs, certainly appreciate it. I am an anchor with 7 News DC, and I'm very happy to be here moderating this discussion for you all today. I wanna thank you for taking this hour out of your day to learn more about scleroderma and its impact on the patients. It is one of many rare diseases, the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition brings awareness to in hopes of changing the status quo by getting patients an early diagnosis, increasing clinical trial enrollment, pushing legislation, attaining research dollars, and empowering patients. Now, while we think that rare diseases impact a small portion of people, I do want to point out that when you make a list of all the rare diseases, you see a large number of people who are impacted. And like a host of rare diseases, marginalized groups are often disproportionately affected by them, scleroderma included. They deserve a good quality of life, which is why it's so important that we are bringing awareness to this rare disease and why it's so so great to have you all joining us today. Now, without further delay, we are going to hear from someone whose name we are all very familiar with. She is a songwriter, rapper, actress, and producer, Queen Latifah, who is sharing her story of how scleroderma has impacted her life. She just has a bright, enigmatic smile. I mean, at home she was shy, kind of more introverted, but you know, when she would get around people, she would light up, especially around kids. She loved educating, she loved being an educator. I never actually had my mother as a teacher in school, but I had her as a teacher in life. I think she was a huge influence on my musical career and on entertainment in general, because she played so much different kinds of music that I always had a wide palette when it came to my musical taste, which helped me later on when I came to love hip hop. She played as much hip hop in her car as we did. <laughs> she was a hip hop head. I just remember getting a phone call and someone said that my mom had passed out. We had to get to the hospital and find out what was going on and we didn't really know what was happening at first. And finally, after many, many tests and several different doctors and back and forth, um, we finally got a diagnosis that she had scleroderma. That was terrifying to hear because now we had to figure out 
what does this mean? You know, this was a shock to her, it was a shock to us, and it just meant we had to get closer and do homework and talk to these, our doctors and try to figure out what to do next because this thing is happening and we have to do what we can to band together as a family and help my mom navigate the, the this, this disease. My Aunt Rita was a sweet, beautiful woman. She was a teacher. You know, she taught me a lot of positive things. I was Aunt Rita's primary caregiver 24-7 and definitely paid a lot of attention to her medication and kept her uplifted on days that she was feeling down. My cousin Tina is like my rock. I trusted her and I was really fortunate that she was around to be able to come in and be part of the team and help. You know, it took it took a village of us to really make sure that everything was on point. And I don't know what I would have done without them. We used to call it Team Rita. Even if someone's there doesn't even say anything, just the idea of having someone with you, around you, letting you know we're here to protect you. We got you. Well, this diagnosis is definitely something that's gonna require you to fight. The interstitial lung disease was pretty difficult for my mom. There was scarring on her lungs, which made it harder for her to breathe, which meant she needed to go on oxygen eventually, which took a huge part of her independence away. And we could clearly tell a difference when she was not on oxygen compared to when she was. I think it's important to be part of this campaign to raise awareness about sclerodermas, just so people don't know they're alone. There is information out there that you can get that hopefully can make your journey with it um, a little less challenging. My mother was, I, anything she could do to help someone else have an easier journey, she wanted to be a part of. A moment to thank one of our sponsors, Behringer Ingelheim, for sponsoring this event, as well as the RDDC and the BWHI. So thank you again to that sponsor. Now we have a panel for you of experts and doctors who are sharing their expertise about this rare disease. I want to take a moment to introduce to you Dr. Francesco Boyne. He is the director of the Division of Rheumatology at Cedar sinai Medical Center. We also have with us this afternoon, Dr. Virginia St Dean. She is the chair of Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of the Scleroderma Foundation. And we also have with us Dr. Christopher King. He is the medical director and advance of Advanced Lung Disease and Transplant Program at Inova Fairfax Hospital here in Virginia. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon and sharing your expertise and insight with all of our audience members. I want to start with you, Dr. Steen. We heard Queen Latifah explain that after many doctor's visits, her mother finally got a diagnosis of scleroderma. What are the signs and symptoms of this disease? So the, there are many different signs and symptoms. The most common is what we call Raynaud's, which is cold induced color changes in the fingers. But particularly in African-Americans, they might not appreciate the white or the bluish changes in the fingers. And so consequently, they don't necessarily recognize the Raynaud's joint pain, swelling in the hands. Those are also very common symptoms. And often they'll go to their doctors and they'll test the blood and they'll say, oh, well, you know, there's nothing really wrong. You just have some aches and pains. And so that's why it can be very hard to uh, diagnose. They're very nonspecific symptoms. Right. Dr. Boyne, I want to bring you into the discussion here. Can you explain what the difference is between the localized and systematic scleroderma? And we heard Dr. Steen mention some of the signs and symptoms. They kind of sound like maybe um, arthritis. Why is it that it's such a hard uh, disease to diagnose and there's so many misdiagnoses of this disease? Yes. <clears throat> it's hard to be here. Thank you. So uh, scleroderma, you know, comes from the the name comes from the Greek. It means literally hard skin. And uh, that's the dominant features that, that we detect in the vast majority of patients who are diagnosed with scleroderma. In the localized form, this is just affecting the skin, either in the form of a small patch of hardened skin or in some patients more diffusely. But the important part is that uh, it, usually this remains confined to the skin. Uh, and in general, has a more benign course and respond well to therapy. 
In contrast, the systemic formal scleroderma, you know, the systemic sclerosis, uh, definitely affect the skin in different, you know, degrees. But most importantly, it's a disease that is deeper than the skin. And, and as Dr. Sting was mentioning, the challenge is really to understand how you affect the patient. It goes deeper, starting from the blood vessels and uh, any possible organ. So I think you know, it's a complex disease that starts in a very smoldering, deceiving way until it hits hard and sometimes limit you know, the quality of life and even the lifespan of our patients. Now, early diagnosis is the key. Sometimes the initial symptoms are vague, uh, joint pain, arthritis, a little cold sensitivity, which can be feature share with lupus or other condition that we normally see in rheumatology. But I think an expert physician or expert centers have the ability to really look carefully to the skin, to the blood vessels. For example, we can look at the male fold capillaries and also to interpret in a smart way the blood test. So I think, you know, we have the ability to make an early diagnosis, but sometimes you need experience, you need expertise because it's a rare disease. And I think, you know, the, the hope is really that, that awareness will bring patients earlier to our attention so we can really help them. Absolutely. Dr. King, I want to talk to you about the diffuse scleroderma patients and why it is crucial for them to get an early diagnosis. We heard Queen Latifah mention that her mom had a lot of scarring on her lungs. Can you speak to the importance of getting that early diagnosis of those diffuse scleroderma patients? No, I do think it's very important that um, <clears throat> both limited and uh, diffuse scleroderma patients have a close look for other disease manifestations and uh, in particular pulmonary disease, which has probably the biggest outcome uh, or impact on outcomes. Um, you know, you can have either with limited disease uh, development of increased pressures in the lungs, something called pulmonary hypertension, which can cause shortness of breath um, and, uh, and can be uh, treated uh, with medications um, which can help patients feel better and, and live longer. Um, and then with the scarring on the lungs, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, treatments that are available. Um, and so our, our colleagues in rheumatology are always screening for uh, evidence of, uh, of lung disease and, and referring, and, and it's a sort of a team effort uh, between the pulmonary doctors and the rheumatology doctors to develop a treatment plan for those patients. Absolutely. Uh, why is it, uh, Dr. Boyne, that scleroderma presents itself earlier in African-American patients than non-Black or African-American patients? Yeah, this is a very, very critical question that all of us have been asking. Uh, all, all of us are involved, you know, significantly with clinical care, appreciate how the disease hit in a different way, different ethnic populations, and particularly African-American uh, we have seen, you know, earlier disease, more organ involved, limited lifespan. Now, the, the explanation is, is not a one answer type of, uh, of, of, of answer. I think there are different factors. Uh, there are certainly, um, you know, we, we heard a lot about socioeconomical differences being important and having an impact, you know, in terms of, you know, um, unequal access to health care, uh, you know, economical level, poverty, uh, but certainly we, we also appreciate there are uh, environmental factors that, are, that plays a role and may explain why different groups may have different type of uh, disease manifestations. So uh, exposure to infections, certain type of diet. Um, mm -hmm. So those are important. And then stress. Stress is not a minor problem. And I'm not, I don't mean stress like a, a bad day. I mean sometimes global stress or, or like a social stress. And then finally, biology. Uh, and so I think all of us who are really giving our professional life to, to, to study and to care for scleroma patients, we really are trying to, to, to look at all these factors and see how they, they impact you know, the, uh, the outcome and, and the onset of the disease. Um, I think it is an important area, and, and, and that's where all the effort should go. I want to also mention very quickly that with the tools that we have now, we can really, you know, to study the, geno the genomics, to study uh, the biology, we can really start to see how this is connected to, to the environment, to the lifestyle, to the stress. And I conclude saying that, you know, chronic stress, you know, caused by economical insecurity, discrimination, mm -hmm. you know, systemic racism, is not a minor um, driver of what happened on, on, on the front of the healthcare. Um, some patients you know, may not have 
um, immediate consequences, but we have found that the uh, changes in the genome can bring consequence to the, the next generation. So stress now can have impact even in the next generation. So I think these are important factors to all study together to have a better understanding of why certain uh, you know, patient population are hit so hard by this disease. Wow, that is very interesting. Dr. Sin, I want to pull you into the conversation here. Um, we heard Dr. Boyne kind of touch on maybe the triggers of scleroderma. What would you say causes scleroderma to attack the immune system uh, and, the, and the body's tissue? We really don't know at this point. There's a multitude of different immunological factors that go on um, that can affect the skin and the lung and the blood vessels, the heart, the kidney, blood vessels, um, but we really don't understand. And that's what makes it so challenging because if there's one pathway that triggers something, and maybe if we block that pathway, then another pathway can, can still make the whole thing active and progress. So that's, I think, really what has made it so challenging to treat. Well, what are the current treatments available or therapies available? Well, there are, there, we now finally have a few uh, therapies that have officially been approved by the FDA. Up until now, most all the drugs that we've been using have been pretty much general drugs for the treatment of the different manifestations. So we have blood dilators for the ray nodes in the fingers. We have anti-inflammatories for the joint manifestations. We have anti-reflux medicine for reflux in the esophagus and in the intestinal tract. Um, sort of the main immunosuppressive drug that we have used throughout many years now is called mycophenolate. And we have used that primarily for skin and lung. And we now have some, I think 15 drugs that are approved for the pulmonary hypertension pulmonary arterial hypertension that Dr. King mentioned, which used to be a totally deadly complication in scleroderma, which has now been turned into a manageable disease. But again, we have to make the diagnosis early. And then just in the last few years, we've had two drugs that have been approved for the treatment of the interstitial lung disease. Um, um, one drug called Nintendineb uh, and another more recently approved Tocilizumab. Uh, which are perhaps different times or maybe different amounts. We're learning how to use these different medications. But the exciting thing is that we have options now, mm -hmm. but we have to get the patients into experts, um, you know, general, not all general rheumatology and general pulmonologists are going to have the expertise um, to know how to deal with these very complicated patients. And it also requires communications with the pulmonologist mm -hmm. and the rheumatologist. Uh, we certainly don't know all about the oxygen and all about the, the pulmonary aspects. And I know a lot of the pulmonologists don't want to have to deal with all the other manifestations. Uh, that our scleroderma patients have, because it really is a, a multi-system uh, disease, and it, it takes a lot of assistance from lots of people to take care of these patients. Right. It right. sounds like a team effort on the medical side, as well as a cocktail of drugs to, you know, help these patients. Dr. King, I do want to ask you, when you see your patients, can you describe their quality of life pre-treatment and post-treatment? Uh, sure. <clears throat> you know, a lot of these patients are very much impacted by the pulmonary disease, and that's the type of patients I see. So they, you know, they're limited in how much exercise they can do. They're limited in, uh, you know, how far they can sort of, like their world becomes much smaller. They become mm -hmm. sort of homebound, dependent on oxygen, um, uh, you know, disabling uh, Raynaud's sometimes with, with wounds on their fingers. Um, you know, some patients will get swelling and, uh, a lot of patients suffer with esophageal symptoms, and a, a lot of that uh, can improve with treatment. Uh, you know, again, it takes a multidisciplinary team, gastroenterologists, rheumatologists, um, but with um, medical treatment of their interstitial lung disease, um, pulmonary rehabilitation, oxygen therapy, um, adequate nutrition and treatment of their reflux, uh, and their and their Raynaud's patients can improve their quality of life substantially. 
um, and do more and, and, you know, live a longer life, a more normal quality of life um, in, in extreme circumstances, you know, because a lot of these diseases tend to progress even with appropriate treatment. Um, you know, in, in the correct candidates, we can do lung transplant too, which can be really, um, you know, transformative in terms of their quality of life. Although uh, scleroderma patients uh, do have some unique issues that you face when, when doing lung transplants on them and, um, because of the Raynaud's and reflux disease, et cetera. Understood. Uh, you know, Dr. Steen, is scleroderma awareness better today than in 1995 when you became involved uh, with what would become the Scleroderma Foundation? Um, well, I certainly hope so. Uh, we have worked through the Scleroderma Foundation for all these 25 years. We've recently had that 25th uh, uh, anniversary, and uh, we have um, meetings on the Hill. We've gotten uh, special uh, grants that are through the Department of the Defense. We've lobby, so to speak, the NIH, but again, it's a rare disease. And so that the funding for research is uh, always challenging. And it's just wonderful to hear that the Scleroderma Foundation is going to be able to uh, have more opportunity for research. The other thing that the foundation has always done a wonderful job on is, is patient education. Every year we have this wonderful conference with two and a half to three days full of, of, of lectures for the patients with all kinds of experts. Um, this is going to be virtual this summer in mid-July, I believe. And so um, that would have a lot of opportunity for patients to learn more about the disease. And over the last maybe 10 years, we've really worked at trying to educate more rheumatologists and pulmonologists because there are not scleroderma centers all over the country. They're in big cities for the most part and, and not every patient has access to a scleroderma center of excellence. And so it's really important that, that we have assistance and through the partner with the scleroderma foundation, we really have been working towards educating um, all kinds of physicians, but particularly the primary care, the rheumatology, and the pulmonologists. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Bowen, we touched on the fact that African Americans are disproportionately impacted by scleroderma. Um, women are as well, and I don't want to leave out children. Can you talk about how children are impacted by this rare disease? Yeah, so it's more rare in children, but uh, we all experience that children can have very, very severe and aggressive disease. Uh, so the, normally it's a midlife kind of onset that we see in our, our patient population. When you affect children, if you exclude the localized scleroderma, we talked early on, uh, the diffuse disease can be, the systemic disease can be very aggressive with a lot of organ involvement. Um, I think uh, the, the, the advantage that kids have is that they are more uh, able to tolerate therapy. So oftentimes our colleague in pediatrics uh, tend to be very aggressive in treatment to stop the disease as soon as possible. Uh, and so being, being younger, they have more, more ability to, to endure this treatment. But nonetheless, uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting opportunity also to study the, the children uh, because of this unique kind of severe uh, manifestation. It's another group of patients that for some reason have much harder disease. And so we can learn a lot. So research is definitely uh, important in this, in this group of patients and it's been done actually to understand why they have this unique life manifestation. Now, typically, once we start research, we're looking into treatments and therapies that requires clinical trials. Uh, are there a lot of clinical trials for this disease, Dr. Boyne? Uh, there's been a lot of interest in studying scleroderma, uh, partly because it's a disease that doesn't have effective or, or uh, established treatment protocol or drugs. And therefore, there is an opening to, to really new discovery. And the FDA, you know, the Food and Drug Administration, really is more open to favor trials and studies in, in diseases that are, we call orphan drug disease, where we don't have very good effective treatments. Uh, the other problem is that it's a disease where fibrosis is very important, scarring, scar tissue. And scar tissue is not just the skin can affect any organ. And if you think patients who have heart disease, kidney disease, all of these can have a problem with excessive amount of scar tissue and fibrosis. So really it's a unique uh, kind of opportunity. Now, uh, the efforts have been humongous 
Bill, as Dr. Steen was saying, we are looking for better way to, to treat this disease. And so our commitment is really to look for the best possible clinical trials and to, and to have the greatest access to these kind of research studies for our patients. Um, I want to mention, you know, research-wise, that uh, it's very true that a lot of research has been done mostly on uh, Caucasian American, European American, as opposed to African American. And that's why it is very important to mention this, this study that, that Dr. Steen and I are part of, uh, that we started called, uh, you know, Genome Research in African American Patients. And, uh, you know, this is a study that, that now includes 25 academic centers across the United States the NIH and the Scleroderma Research Foundation. We partner up to really have a high number of African-American scleroderma patients to study, uh, to have a high number of control, and to use the best possible technology to really try to explain, again, why uh, African-Americans have much more, more severe disease. So we're trying to define and study how the variation of the DNA of the patients across the genome uh, may affect the expression of scleroderma. In other words, if there are changes in the DNA that predispose to much much more aggressive disease. And I think this this is really important study because it will allow us to, to you know, understand better the onset of scleroderma, to understand better ways to define who is going to develop certain complications and possibly to identify novel targets for, for therapies who are more specific, more effective. Absolutely. And that would, of course, help the early diagnosis and, and getting treatment out there. I do want to bring you in, Dr. Steen, and ask you, you know, uh, this is probably a, a huge question, but how can we make sure that, you know, BIPOC people and patients are getting the right treatment and learning about these clinical trials and understanding the research and uh, really getting the treatment they need and the therapy they need before the disease progresses to amputations, organ transplants, dialysis? Well, I think the best way would be for them to get uh, access to a scleroderma center of excellence, which they're all listed on the scleroderma foundation and make sure that their um, doctors that they're seeing are doctors that are involved with scleroderma. And uh, the clinicaltrials.gov lists um, most of the clinical trials. Um, so that that would be the opportunity for them to look on that to see if they have a specific uh, problem that they have a trial um, might be uh, available for them. But I think the most important thing is that they, the patient has to um, reach out to make sure that their doctors are, are educated in the management of scleroderma. Dr. King, do you find that when patients come to you, they have been to several doctors and haven't really been able to figure out what's wrong? Uh, yeah, that's that's extremely common, particularly with uh, with these more advanced uh, lung diseases and, and sort of unusual lung diseases. You know, with patients with pulmonary hypertension, I believe they say see an average of four physicians over the course of about two years before they get a correct diagnosis. I'd say the vast majority, you know, particularly if it's a younger person, they're told they have asthma, they're given an inhaler, it doesn't work. Um, and it's not until they, they see that specialist. And so having that heightened awareness and understanding of, of Raynaud's, you know, for instance, if you saw Dr. Steen or Dr. Boyan, I think they would notice these skin changes and things that are characteristic and, and do that appropriate evaluation and, and, uh, and patients would get referred early when we can really impact the, the course of their disease. Um, and so, you know, efforts like this to really educate, um, you know, uh, primary care physicians, uh, patients, families, and the community, I think, uh, go a long way toward getting, uh, getting those patients to us earlier. I'm going to ask all of you this question, and that is, where do you hope we are in terms of scleroderma research, funding, therapies, cures, uh, five years from now, seven years from now, 10 years from now? Dr. King, I'll, I'll ask you first. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of progress made even in recent years, uh, the advent of, of tocilizumab and, um, you know, how we combine uh, therapies like mycophenolate, tocilizumab, whether we can uh, develop um, biomarkers like blood tests that will tell us, you know, whether a, one patient will uh, benefit from a specific treatment or combination of the available treatments. And I think continuing to develop future treatments, you know, so that we can eventually work toward a cure is the, uh, the idea. Dr. Boyne, I'll have you chime in. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with Dr. King. I think we're not going to see a one drug that does it all. 
Because scleroderma is such a complicated disease that I think that the, 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 the next kind of stage of, or the next phase will be to define combination therapies that address the different problems that scleroderma patients experience. And so I think, as Dr. Steen mentioned, we are doing very good on the vascular disease of scleroderma. Now I think the next step is to, and, and we are at the beginning of this new phase, to identify drugs that target directly you know, the scar tissue, the fibrosis, and then combine this with, with immune suppressive drugs so that you know, the, the three type of domain that we normally face in scleroderma, you know, inflammation and immune activation, progressive vascular disease and scar tissue formation, to find combination therapy that are more effective, but different phases. What's the right time to initiate one or the other? That's where we're going to make a big difference in, in the life of our patients. And Dr. Steen, your input? Wow, <laughs> they pretty much summarized everything. I, I think finding, as Francesca said, finding the treatments that we can do early on and not waiting until they have you know, severe interstitial disease. We cannot reverse this. We have to really do something to prevent this. But that, again, means that patients need to have access to the physicians that are knowledge about this disease and get them treated early. Absolutely. Dr. Francesco Boyne, Dr. Virginia Steen, and Dr. Christopher King, thank you so much for your time this afternoon, for sharing your expertise and your insight. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Of course. Okay, next I want to bring uh, introduce you to someone who is a patient uh, who has scleroderma and really kind of personalize this person's experience with this rare disease. Let's hear now from Eureka. A lot of people have never heard of scleroderma before. So anytime I see someone and they ask me what's going on with me, I always like to tell them what scleroderma is. I let them know that it means hard skin, that it causes your organs to harden. It affects everybody different. It, it can attack all your organs in your body. Mine have attacked my lungs and my GI system and a little bit of the heart. And I just let everybody know that there's no cure. I was diagnosed with scleroderma in 2005. I have never heard of scleroderma when I was diagnosed. In the beginning, I experienced numbness and tingling and weakness in my legs. You just have to figure it out for yourself and just keep fighting for each new symptoms, just go from there. Everybody is not the same with their diagnosis. Everybody's symptoms are different. Everything is treated different. My family has been a major support. I know it's been hard on them. If I was just alone and didn't have my family, I probably would have gave up. And my husband is my main cheerleader. He's always there. Since being diagnosed, it has been a major change in my lifestyle. Since I'm not as active as I was when I was first diagnosed due to the lung disease, a lot of the activities that I do now is just reading a lot of mystery novels, cross-stitching, making baby blankets for friends and family. With scleroderma, I still love to get out and walk in the parks in the squares of Savannah and enjoy the beautiful trees, the oak trees and the weeping willows. With scleroderma, I just plan day by day. Because I have my family in such a huge support system, it just gives me the strength just to keep fighting this disease every day. sponsor there, Behringer Ingelheim, for sponsoring this event as well as the RDDC and supporting their work. For our second panel this afternoon, I want to introduce you to two women who are patients of scleroderma. Uh, first is Demi Montgomery. She's a patient advocate and support group leader for the Scleroderma Foundation. She is a member of the Ohio Chapters Board of Directors and the National Advocacy Committee. She's the driving force behind State Bill 133. And last year in 
2020, she received the Foundation's Advocate of the Year Award. We will also hear from Vanessa Field. She resides here in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, she was actually diagnosed with scleroderma back in 1998 by Dr. Virginia Steen, who we all just heard from. Through years and through the years, she has really dealt with the struggles that scleroderma presents. And Ms. Fields, I want to start with you. Uh, you're also a scleroderma patient and advocate as well, but can you talk briefly just about the struggles that you have had with this, this disease and how long uh, you've been dealing with this prior to your diagnosis? Uh, yeah, um, thank you for having me. Uh, prior to my diagnosis, I was a music major in college um, and playing the piano and I wanted to be an elementary music school teacher. Um, playing the piano, I began to get what I now know is Raynaud's attacks and my fingers would be just basically blue frozen and I'm trying to conduct and hold, you know, the attention of the class. Um, later in 1998, the year that I got married is when I uh, got actually diagnosed by Dr. Steen. Um, I had swelling in my fingers, um, so many other different things and the Raynaud's attacks were constant, but I thought it was due to wedding planning and all, you know, just the stressors. Um, but they thought I had lupus. So um, I was referred to Dr. Steen and she did the test and she said, no, you have scleroderma. And we started a plan of action. And uh, I recommend that some patients don't follow my path because I kind of put it to the side and said, you know what, I, I can't deal with this. Um, did what I needed to do, but I did not take the full action that I needed to, and the disease progressed more than it should have. But uh, yeah, that that's my story, and now I have um, just lung involvement, heart involvement, other things. But you just gotta take it easy and be your own advocate and take care of yourself. Demi, I'll ask you the same question. If you could just briefly explain your experience with this rare disease. And also you are a patient advocate. What do you hear from other people who are dealing with this disease? Um, when I was diagnosed, I was 19 years old. And I, at the time it was a major uh, situation because I didn't understand what was going on. I just had a dark circle on my arm. And so I was misdiagnosed with morphia. And then I got to a specialist uh, rheumatologist and they told me I had scleroderma and so from there I was confused about what would be going on with me so I found uh, the scleroderma foundation and I attended one of the support groups and from there I just kind of took on its own life um, I started going to the meetings regularly and I was able to uh, get really involved with the foundation and their missions um, and so a lot of times, like when I hear the patients talk, they seem to be like confused and alone and looking for some place that can help them. And for me, the foundation was that place. I was able to meet so many people and my whole journey just turned. Um, I ended up not went from depression to actually wanting to be involved and being motivated to get the word out about what scleroderma is and what it does. You touched on something there, depression. You know, we know that scleroderma can present in different ways uh, and it can affect your body image. Can you talk to me about when you're first meeting these other patients, what is their mental state and how do they get past that and get to the place where you got? Um, a lot of times I notice that they seem like they are kind of, um, I want to say manic. Um, they're, they're like really overwhelmed and seem like they just don't know what to do. And it may not just be them. It may be their family members also. Um, some people are in denial. Um, they don't want to accept the disease. Um, so a lot of times uh, for me, I speak to them about starting over. It's, it's almost like you have to allow yourself to give up some of the things that you've always done to start a new journey in your life. And it's, it, it's for us with the foundation to help motivate you in that journey and to make it a positive um, path for you. And so it's a lot of support with this, um, the groups and the support groups and the events. And they're able to talk to people one-on-one -on -one 
and maybe get a more better understanding of what's going on with them so that they're not so in panic mode. And Vanessa, I want to ask you as well, as a patient advocate and someone who has found support with others, what did that do for your mental health and your outlook on life? Um, yeah, I recently, I'm now in Tampa, Florida, near, well, uh, outskirt of Tampa, Florida, and um, I'm part of the Southeast Florida uh, Scleroderma Foundation group. And we uh, started, I mean, I started talk, joining their groups during the pandemic because it was just getting hard um, just to be inside and to have autoimmune disease. And with this airborne coronavirus, how is it even, is it worse for us? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we are um, just really supportive of each other. Um, and, you know, it's, if you're gonna have the disease, you try and make the best of it. Like if you're gonna have the disease, you're gonna have to take a whole bunch of pills, get a pretty pill case. I mean, if it's, you know, just make the best of it and, you know, you know, do things for yourself, get hand warmers. I always have a, a blanket, um, you know, just do what you need to do. Um, don't be ashamed if you carry a coat and you're outside and it's like 80 or 90 degrees. Um, it just happens. You might need extra socks. Um, you know, you're going to have to reinvent how you do things and wear a coat to the grocery store. I mean, just simple things like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You did show your pill case there. And I wanted yeah. to ask you, you know, what does your day consist of in terms of treating scleroderma? Yeah, I, um, on a cell step, I take I have pulmonary hypertension, so I take medication for that. I have GI issues, I take medicine for that. Um, I have anxiety, so <laughs> I take medication for that. Um, so it's just managing things um, in your diet. You gotta lower your sodium, um, anti-inflammatory foods. You gotta incorporate that into your diet. Um, sometimes I cheat, but you know, I, you're going to pay for it the next day. If you're not careful, if you do overdo it, you're going to, you're going to feel the aches and pains, um, water, um, work with your doctor to make sure you're doing the right kind of exercises, not overwhelming yourself, um, muscle, building your muscles up, um, just stuff like that. And then, and then just talk to your doctor. If you're feeling sad, you know, make sure that you're on the right track and mentally stable. Mm -hmm. Demi, I want to ask you, you know, we saw during the COVID pandemic, which we're still in, a lot of disparities in the healthcare system for various racial groups. How do you think that impacts um, people's diagnosis for scleroderma and their access to getting treatment and seeing the right experts and improving their quality of life and getting the answers they need? Well, it, it makes a big difference. Um, for, for a lot of our patients, um, there was a situations where they weren't able to see their doctors. And a lot of times with scleroderma, they need to be able to see, the doctors need to be face to face so that they can actually see the situations. Like for me, I'm an amputee. So I, um, during the pandemic, I, was, I had to actually get a finger partially amputated. And I had to go to get the COVID three times, the test three times before I was able to do that. And that was hard on me because of the, um, I need help to go do things. And so I needed to, you know, my family had to adjust to that situation. So um, it, it really makes a difference with all these um, restrictions they have. And the, as I'm glad they're lowering them and that they're able to um, see face to face once again, because that's a big deal when it comes to scleroderma, the doctors need to see us face to face. You brought up a good point there in terms of needing help from family to get to your appointments and see your doctors and uh, your support groups. How can families support people who have scleroderma? Uh, well, they need to learn about it. Um, and sometimes just being a listening ear is very helpful. Um, a lot of times maybe attending a meeting or um, going with them to their doctor so they can actually understand what's going on. Because some, some patients, you cannot see it. Um, in my case, you can see it very clearly, uh, but in some patients, you just can't see it. And so a lot of times they're told that there's nothing wrong with them. 
And that is a problem because they may not be able to breathe to walk down the street or they may not be able to do certain things um, and they need assistance. But then they're scared to ask for assistance because they're not used to doing that. So it, it's like having an understanding. The families really need to understand what's going on with the person so that they are able to help them in the best way they can. Absolutely. Vanessa, do you find that in dealing with patients, um, their families are either really supportive and super eager to help, or maybe their families are just not understanding and will let the patient kind of endure this on their own? Unfortunately, I've heard both cases. Um, and, and it's pretty tough. You have to roll if if your family is not supportive, you have to rely on your friends, your doctors, and, and your support group, because you're gonna really need a good a good uh, base to lean on. Um, but the people, the patients that do have the family help, like I do, you know, I rely on, you know, my son to, can you go give me this if it's downstairs, you know? And so I just don't get winded. Um, but yeah, you have, you really need the family support and they really need to understand what's, what's going on with you. I want to ask you, Vanessa, what words of encouragement would you have for someone who's been recently diagnosed with scleroderma? Yeah, I would say, you know what, just take in a breath, breathe. We're, we're out here. We are not the only one. Um, and I know it's going to be hard. It's, it's, it's like a punch in the gut. Um, you're going to have to do your studying, but don't get overwhelmed. Study about, especially the, the kind of disease, uh, that you have or whatever is affecting your lungs or your heart or your skin. Um, learn how to take care of yourself. If you have calluses or ulcers, learn how to take that care of that in your skin. Um, just be informed. Um, don't be afraid to take care of yourself first and put your needs first. It's hard um, and your life will change. You won't be able to do everything that you wanna do but it's just a different growth, um, but you're gonna make it. Absolutely. Demi, I wanna ask you, and this is a question I asked the doctors in the panel prior to this one, what are your hopes in terms of research, clinical trials, therapies, treatments, and a cure for scleroderma in the next five, seven, 10 years? I hope that they find it for the next generation um, so that they won't have to suffer as much. Um, we have a lot of children that have it. And um, personally, I, I get so emotional about the children having it mm -hmm. because hopefully in the next five, 10 years, they're able to find something that can um, stop them from having to go through so what some of us have had to go do through. And um, that's a big deal for me. Um, and they can also like, I, I suggest patients advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, talk to your public officials. Um, the foundation has laid out so many different um, advocate programs that you can be a part of um, that will help you uh, get the word out in your community. Um, because what we're finding is a lot of people and communities are, they feel like they're alone and they're not. And the more you get awareness out about what scleroderma is and what it does, the more that we can get the public officials to go towards um, funding these programs so that a cure can be found. Vanessa, I'll ask you the same question. What are your hopes in terms of research, clinical trials, treatment, therapy, and a cure for scleroderma in the next five, seven, 10 years? Yeah, I definitely hope that we can get the word out. Um, special thanks to Queen Latifah and actress uh, Regina Hall. And, and we had before that, uh, Bob Saget, you know, we need those famous voices to put the word out so that, you know, scleroderma patients don't have to say, um, I have scleroderma and it's like lupus. So if we all just educate everyone and let them know that this disease exists, then we can get the funding and then we can get moving with curing this disease. Vanessa and Demi, thank you so much for your time this afternoon and sharing your experiences with scleroderma and the work that you're doing with the foundation to get support out there for other people who have this rare disease. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
And as I wrap up right now, I'm going to say thank you all for joining us for this hour, for this event. It's been great having you along with us. I hope you certainly enjoyed hearing from all of our panelists, our experts, as well as those patients and patient advocates. If you're interested in learning more about scleroderma or the RDCC, you can visit their website. It is scrolling there at the bottom of our screen now. I do encourage you to stay connected with the RDCC, RDDC rather, as they do seek to bring awareness to rare but serious health issues and direct attention to researching the treatments and the cures for those. Thank you again to the panelists and the patients for sharing your insights and expertise. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Hope you all have a great rest of your day.